Hey everyone, and thanks again for joining us here at the Foundry Church. My name is Justin Colleen, and I'm the worship director here. We are so glad that you're here to see all that God is doing in and through his church right now. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, make sure you go and like our Facebook page. There you will find additional content as well as the teachings that you see here on our YouTube channel. And speaking of, if you haven't subscribed for that yet, make sure you do that right now while you're here. Uh, with that said, let's go to our summer series right now, Judah, the Kingdom Chronicles. I am King Amaziah. Go ahead, laugh at me if you want. I know I've lost everything. It's just, it's just that I thought if our God is so powerful, then having their gods would make me, would make the whole kingdom even greater. How could he give victory and then take it all away? Church, welcome as we dive in today to this message. One of the things that will really be an overriding theme in this teaching is the concept, the idea, and the lifestyle of being all in. You know, you hear coaches say they'll take a kid with heart over a kid with talent. Anybody ever hear that said before? Right? And, um, you know, usually it feels like the kid with all the natural talent gets. Uh, gets the gig. But we have seen and we do see quite often people with heart change the world. Um, I'm still close to July 4th, so I'm going to use America, right? I love, I, I'm a shameless patriot of this nation. I love our country and I love our history in so many ways. And one of the things I love is that in the patriot history of the United States, there was a time where the, the constitutional republic hadn't fully formed and the people who knew they felt oppressed we're looking at an enemy that was so great and so overpowering that to go up against Great Britain in 1776 as Britain had zenith in its power. I mean, they said that the sun never set on the British Empire. They oversaw the whole world and they owned the seas. How would you go against Britain when you are a colony of 13 loosely affiliated people groups or states or colonies? How would you do that unless you were all in? And one of the things I've learned in studying U.S. history is that men and the women who caused this nation to come up out of the ground at its leadership level was all in. It was all in because it was either going to cost you everything or why even start down the cause. And when you go all in, you can see that you can go up against a Goliath of an, of an opponent. But when you're all in, sometimes heart, most of the time, heart wins out. Heart says, I'll stick around until I get it right. And I love the idea of being all in. And today we are going to wrestle with and talk about, well, Amaziah. Amaziah was this king who was, he was young as most of them were when they came to the throne. I think he had dreams, he had desires, and he came to the throne full force. And the story of Amaziah is really interesting because he hits it really well. Now, most of you know, I like sports. I know by my shape, you're like, really? But there was a time, right? So don't judge. He'll get to middle age. Um, but there was a time, I mean, I love sports. I love watching it. I love playing. I love, you know, I love football. It's a, it's a ton of fun to me. And one of the things that I think is interesting is um, if we look at Amaziah's life like we would a Super Bowl, which has four quarters, two halves, we could look at it and say, okay, let's break his life down like it were a really big playoff game. Let's look at it in quarters and see what happens. Let's look at it and see what goes on. And there's a little preamble to his story that we find in 2 Chronicles 25, verses 1 and 2. And it says this, Amaziah was 25 uh, when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Jehoiadan, and she was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. 
You know, it's, um, it's painful to read that last sentence because you're like, oh, you're so happy when you finally find a king who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. This series can be a bit exhausting in people turning from God, but you see this. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but he didn't do it wholeheartedly. So let's take a minute and let's look at the very first quarter of the reign of Amaziah. Now, in any big football game, I will tell you this. There's the pre-game jitters. Everybody wants to get out of the locker room and onto the field because you get nervous. I know this happens in other sports. Um, from rodeo to ballet, everybody gets nervous, and they would rather get on the stage and get it done. In theater, it, it holds, the, the context of it really holds. There's these pre-game nerves or pre-performance nerves that get the best of us. In the first quarter, of Amaziah's life, we can see what kind of nerve he had. Did he come in shaking and nervous, or did he come in and he knew what his job was? Did he know what he was going to do? And I want to take a minute and read from Second Chronicles and see how he handled, well, kind of the kickoff, the beginning of what goes on in his reign. It says this, after the kingdom was firmly in his control, after the kingdom was firmly in his grasp, his rule was set, nobody was trying to assassinate him, usurp him, or take the throne. It says this, he executed the officials who had murdered his father, the king. So that's a big decision. He's executing the officials, the leaders of Judah, who had betrayed and killed the monarch. Yet... He did not put their children to death, but he acted in accordance with what is written in the law, the book of Moses, where he commanded this, that parents shall not be put to death for their children, nor should children be put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sin. That last sentence makes me want to start a new series. Because, I mean, theologically, that sentence should make us all be like, whoa, but but in Christianity, but I can't. We'll have, to, we'll have to just put a pin in that one and be like, we'll come back someday. But the line, each will die for their own sin. He adhered, to, adhered himself, like think of like Gorilla Glue. He put himself up against the law of God and he pressed in real tight. He was attached to the law of God. He vindicated his father's death, but he didn't seek blind, bloodlust revenge. He followed the law of God. And we can truly say, that in his actions, he starts out really, really well. He's doing things that would make you, if his life was a football game, he's up 17 nothing in the first quarter, and you think, oh, the route is on. Get a hot dog and relax, right? It feels really good to see someone holding close to the covenant of God as the monarch in Judah. And then the second quarter begins. And I love this because this is where Amaziah reminds me a little bit of like a Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning was famous for getting up to the line, having done all his film work and film study for the game. He would look at the defense, which they're always trying to, to shadow and cage what they're really going to do. And he would read the defense, and you always see Peyton step back, and he'd start tapping the ear holes on his helmet, and he'd start shouting things out. It's called going to the audible. He would call an audible. The play the coach thought was good would get changed. Why? Because Peyton knew the game. He was a student of it, and he would just get up and make the audible. He would make the call right there at the line, and he would pick defenses apart doing that. He was so good at it. Amaziah has that moment where he comes up, and he is in charge. His nerves are gone, and he once again finds himself doing what is right. He's doing everything he should to put himself in position to be a king who feared God and loved God and followed his law. This is what it said in 2 Chronicles 25, 5-10. Amaziah called the people of Judah together. He assigned them, according to their families, to commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds for all of Judah and Benjamin. He then mustered those 20 years old or more and found that there were 300,000 men fit for military service, able to handle the spear and the shield. He also hired, catch this, this is important, he hired 100,000 fighting men from Israel, the northern 10 tribes. He hired them for 100 talents of silver. But a man of God came to him and said, Your Majesty, 
Your Majesty, these troops from Israel, Israel must not march with you. They can't march with you. This is not something God wants. The Lord is not with Israel. It is not with any of the people of Ephraim. That's one of the tribes of uh, the north or a half tribe. Even if you go fight courageously in battle, God will overthrow you before the enemy. For God, and this is really interesting, God has the power to help or to overthrow. Your choice. March into battle with more troops, which you've already paid for, or march into battle with God. Amaziah, knowing the history of God and his faithfulness to his people, he asked the man of God, but what about the hundred talents of silver? That's a lot of money I paid for these Israelite troops. The man of God replied, and I love this reply, the Lord can give you much more than that. Get your eyes off the money. Get your eyes on God. So Amaziah dismissed the troops who had come to him from Ephraim, and he sent them home. And their reaction shows that sometimes leadership is wildly unpopular wildly unpopular they were furious with judah and they left home left for home in a great rage they left for home in a great rage he displeased people to do what was right again makes me think of peyton manning because if you're the running back and the play was to get the ball to you and peyton comes to the line sees something and calls a play to the wide receiver you're like dude it was my turn like and it's sometimes the leader just has to do what's right. And again, in the second quarter, we see Amaziah doing amazing things and following God faithfully. And I love how he goes into halftime, right? He goes into halftime 28 to nothing. He's putting the wood to the historical line of the kings. He is winning this game. Does, is, anybody here, if, is anybody here a big sports fan, right? Anybody here ever have your team go into halftime and you're just wailing on the other team? Feels so good. And the Lions fans are like, yes, I think it happened once, right? But, um, but it, you have this feeling of like you're so happy. And at halftime, I mean, it's nacho time. It's taco time. It's just have fun time because why? Your team is just killing it. You're having a great halftime. The crowd is all kind of wound up and excited, and they're wondering, what will the adjustments be when you come back for the second half? When they come back for the second half. And here's what I know. You, like me, if you're a sports fan, you've experienced where your team comes back from halftime, and they were on fire when they left the field. And they come back, and you're like, the term is, they seem kind of flat, right? Why do they seem kind of flat? And you get this weird feeling between your heart and your mind that says, Oh no, what have you done? Did you relax? What's going on? And then it happens. And maybe you've had this, I know I have, where you're watching something go on. And it's like the coach decided to play not to lose instead of playing to win. And they start doing things and they make a call and, and something kind of terrible happens. It's like a pick six and it goes the other way. And you stand up in your living room with chili and mustard still bespeckling your clothes. And you're like, what are you thinking? Who runs that play right now? We're up. We're up. What are you, what are you doing? And then they put in the pre-event defense, and you're like, oh, my word. They're going to march down the field 15 yards at a time, and we're going to lose. We're going to lose. I mean, it reminds me of the Patriots versus the Falcons in the Super Bowl. 28-3. to Everybody's like... Wow. I mean, Brady got spanked for most of the game, and then something happened. And the Patriots come back and win. And it's devastating and gut-wrenching to watch something happen. And you're screaming as a fan of the team in the middle of collapse, what are you thinking? I want to invite you to the what are you thinking moment in the reign of Amaziah. The moment when you just, when the crowd when, when you at home stand up on your couch, and even though they can't hear you, you scream at them so loud. When you're going to stand up and scream, what are you thinking? It says this in 2 Chronicles 25, verse 14. When Amaziah returned from slaughtering the Edomites, so he put, I mean, he went to war, he devastated them, and then they took 
uh, back in the day, they would take their women, they would take their treasure, they would take their property, and they would return home. Sometimes they would take their gods. It says this, he returned, Amaziah returned from slaughtering the Edomites, and he brought back the gods of the people of Seir. He brings back their gods. He set them up as his own gods, bowed down to them, and burned sacrifices to them. The collective, oh, that's where we scream, dude, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're, God has saved you so many times. God has preserved you. He has spoken to you. He has not only preserved you, he's put your enemies into your hand. And when you get home, you put those enemies, gods, their idols on display and you offer sacrifices. You pray to them and you act like they have power. It makes no sense. It's like after the Revolutionary War and the Battle of Saratoga, if every one of the patriots, and this was their first huge victory in the, in the Revolutionary War, if the patriots had been like, awesome, let's sing the song Long Live the King about King George in England. Everybody would be like, don't we like Commander Washington, that George? Aren't we for him? It would be weird to think of them celebrating you know, and singing God Save the King after they, as, as revolutionary patriots, defeated his army. But that's exactly what Amaziah does. He turns his heart against God, and he begins to worship and pray to other idols. He offers sacrifices to him, and we begin to wonder and think, what are you thinking? What is going on between your ears, in your heart, that has made you think that what you're doing in worshiping other gods is okay? Because remember... Amaziah had bonded himself to what? The law of God. The law of God. And God has something to say about any other gods. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 and 4, it says, 1, 10 commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. The next verse says this, you shall make for yourself, you shall not make for yourself Anything in the image of something in heaven above or earth below or in the waters below, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. If he was bonded to the covenant of God, which he was, he knew this. He knew this commandment. And yet he chose to separate himself. So what I want to do right now is talk about a brutal second half. The what are you doing moment into the spiraling, crushing defeat of a comeback win and you're the victim. He becomes a victim of his own circumstances. All his victories pile up against him. And in the end, what we see is a man who loses everything. He loses absolutely everything because idols in any form, and this is where it gets to the heart of you and I, idols in any form are deadly serious to God. Idols that take any form are deadly serious to God. And we have idols in our lives. And we have things we serve, we strive for, and we fight for, we break relationship for, and they are idols in our lives. So let's hear from the psalmist what God thinks of idols and get a biblical perspective on idols and the effect they have. It says this in Psalm 135, 15 to 18. The idols of the nations are silver and gold. They're made by human hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, nor can they hear. There is no breath in their mouth. They've carved the space out for a mouth, but there's no breath in them. Those who make idols will become like them, and so will all who trust in them. I think that's an interesting statement, and it's one of those things we can move over quickly and not realize the texture of the statement. Those who make idols will become like them, and so will the ones who trust in them. So let's go back up to the description. What is an idol? It has eyes, but it cannot see. It has a mouth, but there's no breath in it. It has ears, but it cannot hear. It has been formed by human hands, so there's no uh, divine destiny to them at all. It's this mute, blind, deaf object. 
And if we look at scripture and ask the question, what are we thinking when it comes to idols? We better be ready to answer back that we're thinking mostly of ourselves. And we're thinking God doesn't really care about the little things. And God think we can look all in, but we don't have to be all in. Because, you know, Jesus loves me and he'll forgive me. He will forgive you. But Jesus requires your whole heart. He didn't die for part of you. He died for all of you. So when we look at this, we can ask, what are we thinking with the idols we serve? What are we thinking when we think that our pursuit of money and ill-gotten gain won't bite us one day? And cause us to harm those we love the most, to possess things? We can never truly possess. What are we thinking when we set up idols in our lives that cannot see, hear, speak, or move on their own? It says that one day we will be completely bound like they are. We will be bound to them and to their fate because we have chosen them over God. We have chosen them over God. I love the quote that has been said, and I've heard it a number of times. It says this, love is spelled T-I-M-E. Time equals love. If you'll spend time with me, you're showing that you love me. And I think that's true in the biblical context. Spending time with God really does matter. It's because you're engaging in the living God. In a relationship with the living God, his living word, his Holy Spirit, alive and connecting with you. Time. And time spent worshiping our idols through our work, through our play, through whatever we justify. I will tell you this. With that love for them, that time we spend on it, makes us deaf, dumb, and blind to God. And if you think I'm wrong, join me in Revelation chapter 9, the very last book of the Bible given to John the uh, Revelator on the island of Patmos. He's on the island, and God gives him a vision of the end times. Gives him a vision of all the end times. And he talks through the the things that happen to uh, the population of the earth. There are plagues. There are punishments. A third, I can't remember if it was a third or two-thirds, of the earth's population dies. They die in these plagues and punishments. And the people who remain alive are deaf, dumb, and blind because their life is fixated on an idol. It says this, after all of mankind has um, been killed, it says, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see, hear, or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their theft. At some point, we become so hardened to the, to the effect of sin on the world around us. We don't even repent when things are spinning out of control. Revelation says most of the earth's population will die and people will still be pursuing ill-gotten gain, comforts, luxury, sexual immorality, and everything in between. Why? Because they become like their idols. They can't see God. They can't perceive God. Their hearts are dedicated to the purpose of gold, silver, or their own desires. We have to ask the question. I have to ask you. I have to ask me. Are you all in? Are you all in? Or is this just something we do? Are you all in-ish? Right? Are you all in, period? Or are you all in unless it doesn't go my way? Are you all in until God takes away your health, your finances, your influence, and your friendships? Or are you all in, period, because God is God and he called you to himself? Are you all in? The question we have to answer is one that we could sit in this room and say, oh yeah, I'm definitely all in, but it has to be done in the quiet space of your own heart. In the place in your heart where you have to ask the question, if God gave me every desire of my heart like he did to Amaziah, would I do the same thing he did and turn to other gods, to other comforts, to other things to trust in? Am I all in? 
Or am I just conveniently all in because I was raised in a Christian home? Because it's more beneficial for me to be in the faith than be out. Because I don't want to go to hell, but I don't really want to live like a Christian. Are you all in or are, all you, are you all in-ish? Because ish is no faith at all. Ish means that at some point you're going to reveal that you're being a chameleon. And you'll go imitate something else. All in says this, Lord Jesus Christ, I submit my life to you, to your work, and I don't trust in my circumstances, good or bad. I trust in you. I trust that you are God over them. I trust that you, God, have eyes to see, and indeed you see. You have a mouth to speak, and indeed you have spoken. You have breath in your, in your lungs, in your mouth, and you have sent your spirit out and filled me. You, God, are no vain, constructed idol. You're the God of the universe. So if he's a little bit bigger than we can understand, praise God for that. I don't want a God I can fully understand. I want a God who's bigger. I want to trust in him. I want to trust in him and know that he sees bigger. I want to be all in with him. And I will tell you, for me and for you, it sounds really good, but the test comes beyond these walls. When we have to be all in when things go in the tank or when things get really good. I challenge you today, friends, Answer the question, are you all in? Are you all in for God? Are you willing to follow him in thick and thin? Are you willing to trust him in spite of it all? Because he has called you according to his purposes and for the glory of Christ Jesus. And when your life is bound to that, God is going to seek out every dark corner in your life and remove the sin. Not, for, not because he doesn't love you, but because he wants your life to become a living reflection of Jesus Christ. Is it easy? Not always, but it sure is fun. It sure is fun to see God at work, changing the world around you through your everyday, ordinary life. Go all in with him who went all in for you. Go all in with the Lord Jesus Christ and see if the kingdom doesn't indeed come to bear in the world around you. Pray with me. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the life of Amaziah. And thank you, God, that we can look and know that for us, the ending hasn't been written. And we have already had probably a number of the what are you doing moments in our own lives. So, God, today we confess that we have worshipped things and pursued things that did not honor you. And we confess that we are in sin and we need you to redeem us from that. So come, Lord Jesus, and call us to yourself. And may we run full force at you and jump into your arms with abandon and find ourselves all in for the glory of Christ and your purposes in this world. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks again for joining us for today's message. If you are looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's message, make sure that you click the link below in the description right now and that'll take you to our weekly devotion page. Weekly devotions are a very important part to our weekly rhythm here at the Foundry Church. We really hope that God spoke to you in a powerful way today and we cannot wait to see you again next week.